Uh, I should just mention that I have done a little bit of work on behalf of Tequila before, but I mentioned stem cells only once in this whole talk. So I hopefully, hopefully it won't make any difference. The Fistula Research Unit once again. So the questions I thought we might think about um, in terms of where research perhaps might go over the coming years, the 25 years that remain of my career, and, and uh, many of you will have more or some perhaps less than that, the lucky ones, um, are to think about, first of all, improving diagnosis and also tied in with that etiology. Particularly, I think, um, factors associated with progression from abscess to fistula and also identifying Crohn's disease earlier. I won't talk about any of the imaging. I've grayed that out because we've talked about that already. Then we'll spend a bit of time talking about novel treatments, how we might identify new targets for treatment through an improved understanding of pathophysiology, and also talk about how we might improve existing treatments, because they are, after all, what we have in front of us. So how can we use them to the best of our ability? And finally, to talk a little bit about the research that we might do in the future and improving it, improving how we do the research that we're all going to be taking part in in the coming years. So understanding pathophysiology first of all, I think the key here is identifying factors associated with progression to fistula. It's about fistula persistence, what makes the fistula appear. We understand the adenoma carcinoma sequence, right? We all get that, that's a principle we all understand. And we understand some of the factors which merit, which predict a more rapid progress along that sequence. We all know what a high-risk polyp looks like. And we can screen for that precursor lesion, the high-risk polyp. And then we can intervene to prevent progression from the high-risk polyp to cancer. So there's a precursor lesion there. And if we understand the precursor lesion and when and why it progresses, then we can understand etiology a little better and facilitate screening and perhaps prevent progression. Well, we have a, a precursor lesion in anal fistula as well. And for me, this is an opportunity for us to improve our etiological understanding. I think ulcerative colitis and pouch fistula may also help here. Bear with me as I talk you through this diagram, which is a stream of consciousness that's appeared on the, on the screen there. We've got cryptoglandular fistula, we've got patients with Crohn's disease, some of whom will have, will have anal fistula. We've got patients with ulcerative colitis, some of whom will have anal fistula. If you're one of those people who takes the view that an ulcerative colitis patient with a fistula has Crohn's disease, I disagree. I don't think that's true, and I don't think it's a helpful way to think about it. And we also have patients with pouches, probably formed for UC, who also have anal fistula. And in the middle there, is the fistula itself, that complex, difficult fistula. If we think about inflammatory bowel disease, and we think about exclusively in terms of Crohn's and UC, well then we don't really have anywhere to go with this conversation. But if we think about inflammatory bowel disease broadly, and different phenotypes within inflammatory bowel disease, some of which look a bit like Crohn's, and some of which look a bit like UC, and then we think about fistula as a phenotype within that group, with crossover between Crohn's and UC, there will be factors which are common to the fistula patients within those two groups. And they will also be common to the fistula patients who have a patch. And they'll also be common, perhaps, to the fistula patients who don't have IBD at all, but have difficult, recurrent, aggressive, recalcitrant anal fistula of cryptoglandular origin. And if we can identify what makes those patients similar to each other, then we will identify and understand something special about fistula and their etiology, and why they persist. It may be a genotypic feature, it may be something to do with their immunotype, but there will be something that makes those patients particular and specific and develop fistula, regardless of which of those groups they come in. And I think the other thing to think about when we think about pathophysiology of fistula is to separate etiological and persistence factors. Now this is something that surgeons are very good at. We all understand that an anal fissure is caused by straining at hard stool, and we all do that from time to time, but we don't all get chronic anal fissures. For that, there needs to be another factor which drives the process, and we think of it as spasm and relative ischemia of the area, which means the fissure can't heal. 
So in anal fistula, if cryptoglandular sepsis or perhaps Crohn's related ulceration or another cause starts the process, what is it that makes it persist? Well, you might say it's an abscess fill and it becomes a fistula, that's what they do. I don't think that's true either. I think there are some abscesses that don't become fistulas and I think there are some which do. What is it that separates those two out? To discuss that, I want to go through the um, literature on immediate layopen, which was alluded to earlier on. There are five English language RCTs and a sixth in another language which have been included in two meta-analyses, one of them a Cochrane Review. These are all studies which took a patient at the time of abscess drainage and randomised them to either drainage of the abscess alone or treatment of a fistula if it was found. And then they looked at outcomes, meaning how often patients represented with a fistula. Two of the studies only included patients who had an internal opening. So these are acute fistulas. There is no denying that those are patients who would have a fistula, particularly if you placed a seat on through their internal opening. But in the drainage only arms of those studies, between 9 and 29% of patients developed a fistula, no more than that. Whereas in the fistula treatment arms, between 83 and, in those two studies, 100% of patients had a fistula identified. So what does that mean? Here's the group who, if you drain their abscess only, will return with a fistula, 29%. And here's the group, thinking pessimistically, who at the time of your drainage have an internal opening and if you ignore it, they will never get a fistula. So what are the implications of this? First is that persistence or recurrence or whatever you want to call it, the appearance of a fistula after an abscess is not ubiquitous even when there is an internal opening. That means that identifying the factors that leads us to persistence within the, the group, you've got the 29% who do get a fistula and the rest who don't, if we can identify the differences between those two, then we identify those factors which drive persistence. Which means we can understand the pathophysiology better, a bit like understanding the adenoma carcinoma sequence. And we can then undertake a screening test. Maybe it will be biopsy of the, of, the fistula, of the abscess cavity wall, which is comparable with our colonoscopy. And perhaps we can undertake an intervention, which might be medical or surgical, which might prevent the abscess from ever becoming a fistula in that 29% of patients. <coughs> and the second implication is that immediate fistula treatment, immediate fistula treatment, whether it's lay open or seat on insertion, is usually the incorrect thing to do, contrary to what the Cochrane Review said and contrary to what we heard earlier on. Because if you find an internal opening and you ignore it in a primary abscess that you've just drained, half the time it will get better on its own which is just as good as phylac and baft and advancement flaps and lift and so on and so forth. Whereas if you put a seat on in, then you convert all of those patients into someone who's either going to have a lay open or they're going to have a sphincter preserving treatment and all of the problems that we've been discussing all morning and will continue to discuss this afternoon. So that is my plea and I know that it's echoed by several people in the room. If you find a fistula in a primary abscess, Leave it alone. It will be your best success rate apart from my own. Thank you, David. Speaking from David's heart as well as mine. Okay. So what causes persistence? This is my answer to that question. This is my answer to lots of questions in my talk today. And please note at the bottom there the unknown unknowns. This uh, fistula persistence is a multifactorial process. The different aspects of the pathophysiology. There are many of them. There are many of them that we don't understand. If we don't deal with these problems, then the fistula will persist. If when we do our operations, we don't deal with all of these problems, then the fistula is likely to recur. Okay, what about identifying Crohn's earlier? I'm going to spin through this very quickly. Those same HES data that I showed, talked about earlier on, which demonstrated that women with an abscess are more likely to progress to fistula than men with an abscess, in, that same, in those same data, we identified that 3% of anorectal abscesses treated in are diagnosed with Crohn's disease. I'm sure everyone in the room has drained more than 100 abscesses in their careers. Maybe not the gastroenterologist, maybe, I don't know. Everyone else? 
So three of those patients, for every 100 that you did, had Crohn's disease, which you didn't know about before you did it. Certainly I wasn't picking up Crohn's disease 3% of the time when I've been draining abscesses in this HR and a registrar. So this is an opportunity for us to identify these Crohn's patients early, rather than 14 months later, which is what generally happens according to our HES data. And probably the way to do that is with some kind of screening assessment, followed by a faecal count protecting. Again, this is work in progress. Improving existing treatments is a really valuable area because existing treatments are what we have and we have to try and make the best of them. At the moment, we can use most of the sphincter preserving procedures only on straight non-branching transphincteric tracts with an efficacy of around 50%. Uh, you said 60 earlier on, and my own money is on 50. I'm slightly more pessimistic. So I have two questions regarding existing treatments. Can we change the more complex ones into straight transphincteric tracts which we can then treat with FINAC or BAFT or LIFT or Advancement Flap or BAS injections or whatever we want to. And secondly, how can we improve on that 50% efficacy that we seem to always come to after a few studies have been produced? Now there's an enormous variety of sphincter preserving procedures out there, but actually if we think about them in terms of their impact on the pathophysiology of the fistula, maybe there isn't quite so much variety at all. Some of them obliterate the tract from the inside, some of them disconnected from the gut, some of them fill the tract, some of them might even do two of these things, although <coughs> I don't think any of them do more than that. They all demand a specific fistula morphology, and we've talked about this, so I'm going to spin on through it. Here is a transphincteric tract which we might really like to do a sphincter preserving procedure on. But what do we do about that big abscess, which is going to make probably most of our procedures fail if we undertake our sphincter preserving procedure now? Well, the answer is we make a great big hole, right? We make a big hole in the skin and we make a big hole in the levator plates and we let all of the pus out and we cross our fingers and hopefully with a CT in place it will become a nice straight transphincteric tract we can then treat. But maybe there are minimally invasive ways we can think about for doing this. And this is delta VAFT. We've named it, you know, why not? That's what you do when you see something, right? Even if everyone else is doing it too. Maybe we can use the VAFT scope up into that cavity. Maybe we can drain that cavity, burn it, shrink it down, and turn this fistula into the kind of fistula that we can treat in another way. And I'm sure there are lots of other ways that people could think of to try to get rid of these secondary extensions and cavities so that we can then go on to use one of our sphincter preserving procedures. And my second question was, why don't these existing treatments work in everyone? We've just invented this brilliant, expensive new trick, and it only works half the time. It's just not fair. Well, the answer is uh, this diagram again. Once again, this is a, a Crohn's disease diagram, but I think these factors work just as well in the kind of difficult, chronic, cryptoglandular fistulas that we are also talking about. And we all know that if you don't address all of the factors, leading to pathology, then you won't deal with the disease. If you've got someone with peptic ulcer disease and you don't treat the underlying helicobacter pylori, then all the PPIs in the world won't heal their ulcer, right? We know that, that's what we're dealing with every day. The same is true with anal fissures and straining. If you don't get rid of the straining, the fissure will immediately recur. If you don't treat the underlying features, all of them, then you're simply ice skating uphill. That's a reference that no one ever gets to a very brilliant movie. All right, very good. <laughs> and that means that when a new fistula treatment comes along and people say, I've got this exciting, brilliant new trick device that I'm going to treat, use to treat fistulas, if it targets a single or perhaps two pathophysiological factors, I'm not interested. I'm very confident that it won't work any more than the 50 or 60% that we see already. And that's what so many of the um, treatments that have been developed in the last few years, with the exception of one or two more recently, do. What about novel treatments and treatment strategies? Well, for really genuinely novel treatments, I think we have to come back to this diagram once again and think about how we might develop a treatment that will affect all of these, or many of these, pathophysiological factors. And of course the unknown unknowns, which are much harder to treat because we don't know what they are. And that's why going back to the etiological research is so important. But perhaps we can combine strategies we have, because, like I said, they attack one or more of the different factors themselves. So maybe we place a seat on and do a good drainage and a bit of a curatage and leave a bit of time and hope 
that the microbiological factors and the inflammation that are existent will start to dampen down, right? We all do that anyway. And then maybe we do a fire because it's really superb curatage. It certainly gets rid of all of that epithelialization which might be inside the fistula. And then maybe we disconnect the tracts from the gut. We could do that with lift or with an advancement flap, for example. We might give antibiotics, something I've tossed in there <coughs> with physicians. And then we might use something that I would call augmentation with stem cells or plasma or platelets or the fat injection that Lily and the guys are using. And that will attack that hostile environment. It will tip the balance away from inflammation and towards wound repair so that the fistula is working with us rather than against us as we're trying to get it to heal. So this is a really expensive treatment for fistulas. <laughs> But in the, in the recurrent, recalcitrant, difficult fistula who we're EUAing twice a year for the rest of their lives, actually it will probably save everyone money and certainly the patient time. So there's lots of interesting avenues for research, etiological, imaging related, testing and expanding the results of the current treatments and then looking for that holy grail, the silver bullet, which I suspect none of us truly believes will be an individual silver bullet, but is nevertheless something that we're going to spend the rest of our careers working towards. So I also want to take a moment to talk, to talk to you about improving the research that we do. This is my best joke. Heterogeneity everywhere, heterogeneity everywhere, all of it different. It works really well if you're a primary English speaker. <laughs> so, think about patient selection. We, we've heard it all the way through this morning. We've heard people talking about the evidence and the literature and saying, it's, there's a problem because it's all heterogeneous. Patient selection, study size, study design, surgical methods used, follow-up duration and outcome measurements, these are all done in a very heterogeneous way within the fistula literature. But this is something that we can correct. When we select a patient group to undertake our treatments on, we can have a clear and consistent patient group within our publication so that everyone knows that we're talking about a given treatment in a given set of patients. We can use a single etiology. We shouldn't be mixing Crohn's and cryptoglandular fistulas together in a, a study looking at different treatments. We can look at single fistula morphologies. Mm, I'm maybe not quite so wedded to that. You know, the straight transphenteric tract or the horseshoe tract. We might have to be a little more generous, but at least we should be transparent, transparent in our classification of these fistulas. We should also give a very clear indication of the height of the fistula if we're doing anything like cutting cetons or fistulotomy. And in particular, I want to talk for a moment about the fistulotomy and immediate sphincter repair literature. I think this is a real potential problem. Let's say that you're doing a study in a fistulotomy and immediate sphincter repair, and you put 100 patients into that study. And they'll all have transphenteric fistulas, let's say, and they'll be of different heights, because you know, you're putting 100 patients into a study and it's gonna take 100 years otherwise. So 90% of those patients, 90 of them, will have a low or a mid transphenteric fistula, you know, just based on how common these things are. And only 10 of them will have a high transphenteric fistula, and by high, I mean too high for me to want to lay open. So 90% of them could just be laid open with a one in three risk of difficulty controlling wind and a little bit of minor soiling, but nothing else. And the other 10 of them, if you lay those ones open without doing a sphincter repair, they'll run into trouble. They'll have real major incontinence. So you do your study and you do your follow-up, and let's say that 30% or a third of your sphincter repairs fail. A third of them will fail in that 90%. And those third who fail, well, they'll all get difficulty controlling wind and they'll get skid marks in their underwear. So that's the same as they would have had if I'd done my operation and we hadn't done a sphincter repair. And then three of the ten who have a high fistula, three of them, their sphincters will fail, sphincter repair will fail too, and they'll get proper incontinence. They'll have a real problem with their continence. And then when you write up your results, you send following this operation. And I would submit to you that the surgeon who comes afterwards and thinks that they can do this operation in a high fistula will consent their patients poorly. They will tell them that the risk is 3% <laughs> when in fact it's one in three. If we classify the height of the fistula properly when we're doing the research, 
then we won't make that mistake. And I think that although people like Carlo, who do a lot of these operations, will be carefully selecting and they'll understand that, I don't think the literature genuinely reflects that difficult problem. <clears throat> what about study size? Well, the study size needs to be sufficient for a significant outcome, of course. But I think it also needs to demonstrate a minimum sample size for studies where we're looking for no difference. So let's say, for example, we were interested in looking at stomas and whether or not they, they are benefit in um, advancement flap repair of anal fistula. If you do that study in five patients in each group, then there won't be any difference. And you can pat yourself on the back. Well done, we've shown that there is no difference between the two. I think that we should always, we should mandate that anyone giving uh, a result of a study that shows no difference should define the size of the difference that would be detected in their patient population and define the size of the patient population that would have been needed in the study in order to detect a reasonable difference. So that we can very quickly say, instead of, oh, I think it's, I think it's negative because of sample size, we can say for certain that it's negative below a certain level because of the sample size that they've used. We would like to do fewer observational studies and more RCTs as surgeons, right? There are people in the room who have done surgical RCTs very successfully and well done. But if we wanted to do more of these in anal fistula, in the anal fistula literature, then look around you. This is the group. These are the people who have an interest and an expertise in this disease. This is the group of people who can undertake these randomized controlled trials. And the only barrier to it is our lack of will. Surgical method, I think, is really important. Think about the plug literature. We heard about it earlier on initially. Very high success rates, which drifted away. And so all of the plug enthusiasts sat around a table and said, the reason that these guys are getting low um, success rates in, the, in their plug studies is because they don't know how to do the plug. That's not my view, I have to say. But you can see it was a reasonable argument for them to make. And we should head that argument off at the pass. When we do an interventional study, we should demonstrate that the people within it, and I think this is really important for the multi-centre studies. You talked about doing a multi-centre study with 10 patients um, from each, uh, uh, 10 patients from each um, centre. Well, if you're going to do that, how do you know that the surgeons doing those 10 operations are any good at it? How do we know that they're giving a good account of themselves? So there should be evidence of training and some assessment of their competence and experience. Follow-up duration. Again, we could talk about all day. I think we all believe it should be at least a year. My own view is that we can only say that a fistula is healed after a year if we have an MRI to prove it. If we're going on clinical assessment alone, I think we should probably be waiting two years because of those late occurrences which can occur. We should also be checking more than once because of the natural history of um, uh, fistulae. And also, I'm really fed up with reviewing papers that say they have a median of one year follow-up. Median of one year follow-up might well mean that half of your patients only have a few months of follow-up. I think we want a minimum of one year follow-up in order to demonstrate that the fistulas have healed. So it's not that we're trying to hit that number with our median, it's that we're trying that for our patients to hit that duration of follow-up in order to prove that they've definitively healed. And outcome measurement, efficacy and incontinence. I promise I'm coming towards the end, but I'm just gonna take a moment to talk about these two. So how do you measure success? Well, I think that's goal dependent. Now for the cryptoglandular fistulas, most of, most of the time we're gonna be interested in healing. And so we should probably be looking at combined clinical and radiological healing. So the Admire CD guys, Damien sitting there, they were the first people really to take this on and kudos to them. It's a huge advance within fistula research in my view. What do you need? Do you I think there are ways that it could be tightened up further, and I've talked about those before, but as a combined endpoint, I think it's a really good way to assess healing. As I said, it needs to be multiple assessments because next week Mrs. Miggins is fistula, her external opening will have healed, and the week after it might have opened again. So we need to be looking at these patients serially and demonstrating that the fistula has definitively closed. And we need long follow-up, particularly if we're not using MRI to prove it. And then secondary success. We've had a little bit about secondary success today. And we'll all have seen papers, for example, of advancement flaps, where people say their primary success rate was 50% and their secondary success rate was 80%. And then you read that the patients who failed the advancement flap went on to have fistulotomy. Well, I mean, of course they had secondary success. 
fistulotomy always works. And that's not what secondary success means. The lift procedure is the ideal example of it. When you convert a transphincteric fistula that can't be laid open to an intersphincteric fistula that can, and then you lay that open, that's genuine secondary success in my view. And I think we have to be very careful about how we use that term. And if we're not looking for healing, for example, in the Crohn's patient, some of the time we won't leave, then we're looking at quality of life. And we have to be very careful about, the, about how we measure quality of life. It should be patient reported. They don't care what we think about their quality of life. We should care what they think about their quality of life. And then incontinence. I was talking to Charlotte about this over lunch. How we define incontinence as an outcome within the fistula literature, I think, is very challenging. Let's say that before your study in fistulotomy, you measure patients' incontinence according to the VASI score. And they wear a pad because they've got a bit of discharge, which might, which might be a bit of faeces from time to time coming out. That patient will score four on the VASI score, but they're not incontinent. And then you do your laying open operation, and you slice through part of their sphincter, and they don't have any fistula anymore. It heals beautifully, so they don't have any discharge, but now they leak a bit of wind every day. And from time to time, they leak a little bit of stool, perhaps, just a tiny bit in their underwear, just occasionally. So their VASI <laughs> score will be five. So that means they've got no significant difference in their continence after surgery, right? That's what people say when they're writing up their studies, and it's not true. That patient's had a radical and fundamental change to their continence. And we shouldn't hide from that, we should demonstrate it. How do we do that? Well, rather than talking about the numbers alone, we should be talking about what the patient's actual anal incontinence is before and after surgery. And that should be really clear. The same problem occurs because of the numbers. So if you do a lay open, two in three patients will have no change, one in three patients will have a change. Even if that change is quite marked, if you aggregate all the numbers and use a mean, you'll find no difference. So I think we have to be very careful when we report no change in continence as an outcome of fistula surgery. So I think we can look at all of these areas and think about ways that we can improve the way we do research by examining and tightening up the way that we approach each of them. So we as a group are in a position to do this. As reviewers, and, and many of us will be reviewers of fistula research papers, we can demand it of the papers that we review. As leaders within our organisations or within our groups or within our countries, we can recommend to our colleagues that this is what they do. As researchers, we can perform it and lead by example. And as a group, if we do these things, we can change the way fistula research is done. Thanks very much.